The case of complex eigenvalues is also a little bit involved. Still, you can do it. Let's see how this works. So we've got a two by two linear system, complex eigenvalues. Those eigenvalues, lambda one, lambda two, are alpha plus or minus i beta. Now, finding eigenvectors in this case, it's, it's not a lot of fun, but it's not that bad. The eigenvectors v1 and v2 come in complex conjugate pairs. Let's write those out as v1 plus or minus i w1 and v2 plus or minus i w2. Sorry for the confusion, there are too many v's going around, but stick with me. Okay, now what we want to do is diagonalize the matrix A so that we can take powers, take exponentials, things like that. You talk to a mathematician, they're like, easy, haha, <laughs> this is diagonalizable, just use the field of complex numbers. Boom, done. Eh, I don't know, I mean, that's true, but if you talk to an engineer, they tend to want real solutions to problems. And so in engineering, what do you do? Well, you take the real and imaginary parts of everything, you just grind your way through it. That is also a little bit hackish and kind of painful. I'm going to take a middle ground of trying to keep things real, but as clean as possible. Here's the idea. Let the matrix capital V, our change of basis matrix, have entries little v1, little v2, w1, w2. That is the real and imaginary components of my complex eigenvectors. This is going to form our change of coordinates. What happens when we do so? Here's a fact. If I conjugate A by this matrix capital V, if I compute V inverse A V, then what I get is the matrix with entries alpha, beta, minus beta, alpha. This is not diagonal, but it's the simplest real form that we can convert the matrix A into. Now this really turns out to be very nice. Let's focus on matrices of the form alpha, beta, minus beta, alpha. I can write that as alpha times the identity matrix plus beta times the matrix J, where J is my favorite matrix with entries 0, 1, negative 1, 0. This is the rotation by pi over 2. It's the matrix analog of the imaginary number i. Now, what we're going to do is whip out our Euler's formula and convert it into matrix form. Here's a lemma. e to the jt, where j is as above, is cosine of t times i plus sine of t times j. This is a matrix version of Euler's formula. What's the proof? It's basically the same proof as that of Euler's formula. I'm going to split the exponential up into even and odd terms. e to the jt is, by definition, the sum n goes from 0 to infinity of quantity jt to the n divided by n factorial. If I split this up, I can take the sum n goes from 0 to infinity of jt to the 2n divided by 2n factorial. Those are the even terms. I have to add in the odd terms. The sum n goes from 0 to infinity jt to the 2n plus 1 divided by 2n plus 1 factorial. And now, if I remember how powers of j work, remember j squared is minus the identity matrix, and j to the fourth is the identity, and all that stuff, then I can simplify this greatly. The first term is the sum n goes from 0 to infinity of what? I really have negative 1 to the n times the identity matrix times t to the 2n divided by 2n factorial. Aha! And then the odd terms become the sum n goes from 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the n, times j, times t to the 2n plus 1 divided by 2n plus 1 factorial. The first of these, the even part, has the Taylor series for cosine of t built into it, all multiplied by the identity matrix i. The second term, the odd part, has the Taylor series for sine of t, everything, multiplied by this matrix j. That's it. That's the proof of the Euler formula. Now we can use that directly to solve linear systems in continuous time. Here's a corollary. If I exponentiate alpha i plus beta j times t, then what I'm going to get is the matrix with entries 
e to the alpha t cosine beta t, e to the alpha t sine beta t, minus e to the alpha t sine beta t, and e to the alpha t cosine beta t. Now that's a mouthful, but the proof is straight out of Euler. If I want to exponentiate alpha i plus beta j times t, I can split that up into the product of e to the alpha t i and e to the beta t j. The first term is exponentiating a diagonal matrix. That's no big deal. You get the matrix e to the alpha t, 0, 0, e to the alpha t. The second one, by the Euler formula, gives us cosine beta t, sine beta t, minus sine beta t, cosine beta t. Multiply those together and you're done, no problem. So, if you've got a matrix A with complex conjugate eigenvalues, and you write out this matrix capital V to transform it so that AV equals V times alpha I plus beta J, then to exponentiate AT, to compute E to the AT, what you do is you conjugate E to the alpha I plus beta JT by this matrix capital V. We know how to compute E to the alpha I plus beta JT, and that's it. With a bunch of matrix algebra, we're done. That's the continuous time case, but what about the discrete time case where we're taking powers of this matrix? This gets a little more involved. What we need to do is work with the polar form of the eigenvalues. Let's say lambda is alpha plus or minus i beta. I can rewrite that as r times e to the plus or minus i theta, where r and theta are the polar coordinates of these eigenvalues in the complex plane. r is the square root of alpha squared plus beta squared. That's sometimes called the modulus. Theta is the arctan of beta over alpha. In old-fashioned language, this is called the argument, but it's really just polar coordinates. And it's really the key, because if I write out the matrix version of what is going on here, then what I get is alpha times the identity plus beta times j is really this modulus r times e to the j theta. And from the Euler formula, we can see how that is going to work. So what is this going to do for us? What this does for us is it says that if we want to take alpha i plus beta j, raise it to the nth power, then what we really do is we take r e to the j theta, raise that to the nth power, that's r to the nth, times e to the j times n times theta. And if we write out the components of that, this is going to become r to the n cosine of n theta, r to the n sine of n theta, minus r to the n sine of n theta, and r to the n cosine n theta. And that's it. That's how you take powers of this matrix that is in its really nice form, alpha i plus beta j. I'm going to let you worry about the change of coordinates using the matrix capital V. As I said, this gets kind of involved. This is the nicest presentation that I can think of. I hope that it's enough for you to be able to do some problems.